Okay, guys? So we finished with ideals. We talked about Poincaré, intuitivism, sort of all of this wonderful stuff. So now let us go and see how we could find this X and Y constructively, which is the Bache algorithm. Remember the guy who did this recreational mathematics and translated Diophantus actually came up with a beautiful algorithm. And for me, this algorithm is a very sort of difficult thing. Every time I teach it, I get into trouble. I couldn't quite explain it. Once, when I was teaching this stuff in India, I literally collapsed on the floor from exhaustion. And uh, the guy who was my assistant, sort of, uh, instead of teaching this stuff, got the movie recording of my lecture where I taught this stuff and played it. So I escaped. But, uh, and I'm very proud to say that for the first time, I'm not going to to, to feel bad about this stuff because I actually found a very elegant way of explaining it. Sort of, I implemented many, many times. I taught it many, many times. But this is the first time where I finally came up with a sequence of very small steps which anybody could understand or so I claim, at least the ones I could remember while giving a presentation. So, let us look at the algorithm. So we want to find x a plus y b, which is equal to g c d. We want to come up with the algorithm because while we know they exist, it doesn't do us any good till we know what they are. And let us start with doing a trace of Euclidean algorithm. You understand what I mean by a trace? Let's not do it as a loop, but let's write it out. And we will use this profound thing called dot, dot, dot saying that it could be however long. So if you do first remainder, then you do second remainder, and you go down till it becomes zero here, and you return, of course, this remainder, yes? That's the algorithm. Everybody agrees here? Nothing hard, yes? Very simple step. We just write it out just like that. Then we say, ah, why don't we rewrite it by looking at R's. You see, there is this profound thing which you learned in the fifth grade, that you could move this guy to the left with the negative <laughs> side, and then you could flip them so this one will become Rn is equal to Rn minus 2 minus Rn minus 1 times uh, Q sub n. Right? I'm actually going to write it so that we could all look at it. It's very, very important thing. We're actually done. Except the rest is trivial. Of course, you don't see why it's trivial. Let me show you. But that's the key. So everybody follows up to here? It's nothing to follow. It's, it's trivial. Huh? First steps. You see, we wrote these things, and then we observe that a is equal this, 1a, 0, b is equal this, then r sub 1 is a with coefficient 1 minus q1 with coefficient b. So we successfully managed to do the first remainder as a linear combination, yes? Then we could do second remainder. Do you see what we could do second remainder? We, we just plug it. We re rearrange it. It gets minus Q2 times A plus 1 plus Q1 times Q2B. It's, you know, it's simple algebra, not, not abstract algebra. It's a trivial, trivial thing. Right? This is just to show you. You really don't even need to see this slide. Because what you really need to see is this. And this slide took me two days. You might say, what, why it's a trivial slide? Well, making it trivial took me two days. Sort of. And when I made it, I say, so why did I suffer for decades explaining this stuff? Which is self-evident. But you see, you don't always see it like so. Let us assume that we found, we know two remainders 
r sub i and r i plus 1 that we already figured out how to represent them as linear combination. We're doing inductive step. All right. So everybody agrees? We could assume. We could assume anything we like. That's the beauty. But if we do that, then we know that the third i, r sub i plus 2, or the third r, is equal to this. That's f from just the rewrite. Remember, we have this formula. And then we just plug these guys. We plug them in. And what we get? We get this. Well, let us see how we get, I mean, I mean, first of all, we take r sub i and just substitute this. It's literally from there here. No change. Then it's minus, since it's minus, what? We plug the second guy here times q sub i plus 2. Yes? Very simple. We just plug it in. Then we multiply, we open this parenthesis. And we get what are coefficients with a? Coefficients with a is x sub i. So we're distributing. We say that the coefficient with a is x sub i minus x sub i plus 1 times q i plus 2. And with b, it's y sub i, this guy, and then y sub i minus y sub i plus 1, b. Very simple, yes? Now, finally, we know then that the corresponding coefficients for the next guy is this and this. There is an important thing to observe that x's do not depend on y's, and y's do not depend on x's. And that is a remarkable point, which I have been trying to explain to people for many, many years, even if I was not good in presenting this stuff as clearly as now. Uh, people always compute both x and y. You don't need to do it, because you see there is this remarkable thing. We don't need y. Because if b is not 0, we can compute x and gcd and then get y. Because we're just doing this is quotient. We just, we know that gcd ab is equal uh, minus ax is going to be equal to b times y or y times b, right? So we will just obtain y by doing this division. So we don't need to do it in the loop, right? And very often, we don't need it at all, as we shall see. Right? This, is, this is quite quite important to realize. And then the, OK, you have to figure out that what if b is 0? Think about it. It's not that hard. So, and it comes with the following very, very beautiful and very simple algorithm. Again, here I decided to use, again, this quotient remainder. Remember, I mean, one of the problems is that often people compute them separately. I don't want to write quotient and then to do remainder. So, if possible, give me a thing which will compute a pair because it's faster to compute two together. But so you, you, you need to figure out how to implement it yourself. But if you give it to me, it becomes very, very simple. Let us see. We know that we start with 1 and 0, the first, the first pair. And then we literally just use this. Pardon me. We use this. 
we know that we need to have two guys and I will keep, uh, you know, the problem with computers, it's really very inconvenient to keep I variables around. But I don't need I variables. I need just two last ones. And two last ones I'm going to call X sub zero and X sub one. And then they're going to slide down. Right? When I compute new one, I will slide them down. Right? So just so, and that's the formula of how you get the new one. And it's a very simple formula. If you take the sub zero, the first one, multiply the second one by the quotient, and put it there. And of course, you need the new remainder. And to get a new remainder, you need to have not a quotient, but remainder. And basically, to get new remainder, the new remainder by our old formula. How do we get new remainder? By, by doing remainder of two previous remainders. Right? So I need remainder to get new remainder, and I need quotient to get new x. And that's the code. Sort of, I compute here P is a pair which contains quotient as its first member and remainder as its second. Somehow it's computed and given to me. Yes? Then I compute new X. And you say, why do I do temp? You see, because I need to do the following. The new one becomes x1, and x1 becomes x0. So if I write it into x1, I will wipe it and couldn't reconstruct. So I basically would replace that with making this x0 and then doing swap. But Ryan convinced me that this is more clear. By the way, I have to acknowledge great contribution to this lecture by Ryan, who I wrote this brilliant code, except it didn't work. And I wrote this brilliant math, except it didn't work. I changed the order of x0 and x1. And thanks to Ryan, who heroically found the bug and fixed it, fixed the slides even. And then just called me and said, ah, I fixed everything. You really want to have friends like that, huh? So I'm very grateful, truly. I, I'm not ironic. It was, it was wonderful. Uh, so hopefully it has no bugs. Ryan says it has no bugs. So we, we compute new x1 here. But we, we call it temp because we need x1 to put into x0 and then put temp into x1. You see what's going on? It's pretty simple. And then we replace, we do the same operation with the remainder. Again, our remainders go there. Zero remainder is in A, the next remainder is in B. So we're shifting them. We're saying that let us put B into A, we no longer need A, we compute a new one. And the current remainder is B is P dot second. OK? I think it's, it's actually very simple, guys. Except for we need to do two swaps. Because we're, we're sh it's a typical thing. It appears in multiple algorithms. You are running two things, and you're computing the new version of the first. But you couldn't put it in the first, because you need to shift first to the uh, to the zero, right? So it's a fairly typical thing. And when when finally b becomes zero, we know that a is the remainder which we need to return, and we return x. So it's a very very useful algorithm. Why it is a useful algorithm? Uh, this is a project for people who think they are. Clever, that's something you should consider. Remember Stein algorithm? Now, 
try to figure out if you could do extended Euclid based on extended GCD based on Stein. The answer is you can. But I'm not going to tell you how because I have no time, nor do I have particular desire. It's a very nice project for you to do. Uh, the first person who figured out that out, as far as I know, is Knuth. So if you want to show yourself that you're as clever as Knuth, do the project. It's not very hard. It's hard, but not very hard. Uh, so application. Cryptography. Why? Because you see, when we look at our, I am looking for Bashir. You see, this allows us to find multiplicative inverse. And we don't even need y, because it returns x and gcd. So you look, if gcd is 1, then x is a multiplicative inverse of, of b, of, uh, oh, pardon me, of a mod b. Right? So this, this is. You know, again, every time you buy something from Amazon, and I hope you do very often, we want the stock to go up, we have to contribute. So uh, I didn't say anything like that. Uh, I'm not supposed to mention business in this course. Uh, so cryptography, rational arithmetic. Well, it's very hard to do rational arithmetic, which is very useful in many domains, including physics, if you remember Stein's adventures, uh, without GCD. Why? You have to reduce to the, ca you know, otherwise, you know, the denominator and numerator are going to grow, grow, grow. You could not check for equality because you need to reduce to the. You think by dividing on GCD, so you have to compute symbolic integration, very important for symbolic integration. And, and here there is a sort of things where, where I sort of we're getting to the conclusion of this journey to STD rotate, to an STL algorithm called STD rotate. And you now I have to finish with something which relates to you know, STL. You would say, well, but it's a beautiful, beautiful algorithms. That's what we're, we're going to study. And so, believe it or not, daily programming such as rotate. And one of the objectives of this course, this is a joke, is to demonstrate that rotate is a fundamental thing of which you need to know. We will see how rotate is really, and it is, used in a whole bunch of amazing algorithms. And you need GCD to do it. So it's all, everything is connected. You cannot sort well unless you know higher algebra. Uh, OK. Now we have to have a transition. In order to get to things like rotate and to uh, talk about, we need to talk about a very general kind of things called permutations. And uh, permutations are. Well, you probably even know what permutations are, yeah? Permutations are things which permute, rearrange, n elements. So permutation from a final set. It's a function from a sequence of n objects onto itself, onto. Yes? So you start with n things, you, you have n things. Things do not disappear, right? You rearrange. So. The formal notation that mathematicians use, and we will see that mathematicians use very inconsistent notation here. Because, I mean, first of all, it's very inconsistent because people say, oh, it's a matrix. No, 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 it's not a matrix. It just looks like a matrix. It's a permutation. And how do you know from the context? If you read a book on group theory, that means permutation, unless you're talking about representation of groups, then it might be a matrix. But if you talk linear algebra, 
unless you're talking about some areas where you have to leave it out. It means a matrix. So notation is like that. And what you have here always, and these could be arbitrary objects. But mathematicians just write 1, 2, 3, 4. They index from 1. And while I firmly believe in indexing from 0, I have to follow the convention which you are going to encounter in mathematical books. It's so 1, 2, 3, 4. First object, second. And on the bottom, you write where they go. So first, guys go, first guy goes to position 2. Second guy goes to position 1. Third guy goes into position 4. Fourth guy goes into position 3. That's a permutation. There could be very many permutations. Anybody knows how many? N factorial. People actually do. This is very good. It's actually one of your. What, what, what? No, this is not cycle notation. This is cycle notation is not like that. Nobody writes cycles like that. This is a shorthand notation. Observe that this notation is excessive. The top line is utterly redundant. It's always 1, 2, 3, up to n. So mathematicians, why they f immediately introduce this, then after that, they only write this. So first goes into second. So the, basically, what you write is that in the position i is the place where the ith guy goes. You no longer need, you no longer use the first thing. And it happens, right? I mean, any book on group theory introduces it like that. Every mathematician knows that's how you introduce it. And then you never use it for the rest of your life. But so everybody gets the shorthand. Now, example again, 2, 1, 4, 3 applied to a sequence. See, I use different things and I use comma to indicate that it's a sequence of elements, not a description of permutation of these elements. So A goes to the second, B goes to the first, right? So now, that here I have to sort of do some introduce terms which are very common terms. There is a notion of a symmetric group. And it's a very important notion because it's a group of all permutations of n elements. It's really the most important group there is, symmetric group. Right? So. Permutations of L elements are called S sub n. This is standard mathematical notation, except this S sometimes is Gothic S in some books. But recently, Gothic things start disappearing from mathematics. So normal S seems to be the most common, common thing. But you might encounter Gothic S, which looks very funny, by the way. Uh, so. Let us see why it is a, why it is a, a group. First of all, what is a group operation of two permutations? Composition. You apply one, you apply another one. Composition is associative of any two functions, sort of by definition of composition. Ident what's identity element? It's identity permutation. What's representation of identity permutation? One, two, three, four, whatever. Right? It's identity. Everybody goes into himself. Inverse permutation. That's the one Param loves. He even saw it before he saw the direct permutation. Uh, again, it's inverse permutation. You know, you just go back to where you come from. It is a permutation. It's a group. As you correctly observed, it has n factorial elements. And there is a remarkable theorem in group theory, which is trivial. And I actually literally proved it to you when we talked about groups in the previous lecture. And it's known as Cayley theorem. And 
it says that any finite group is a subgroup of the symmetric group. Which is, if you know symmetric groups, you know it all about finite groups. What's the proof? Well, you take a group, it has n elements. Well, every group could be viewed, as we discussed, as a transformation, permutation group of its element, viewing every element as a permutation of other elements by multiplying. You take element A, and you see where it sends other elements when you multiply it by that. Right? So it is a subgroup of a permutation group of n elements. All right? It's not very profound, but we just know that you know, symmetric groups are very important. Okay? We solved that one. If you don't see why they solved it, think at home. But we answered the question. If you don't see it right away, you need to go back home and think about what's the order of the group. Yes, and that's, that's the only thing to do. Uh, do I have it? Yes, I have it as a problem, but maybe we will talk about it. Uh, transposition IG. There are, certain, there are certain elements in this group which generate the entire group, which generate it. And the nicest set of generators you could imagine, there are multiple set of generators, but if you like the canonical set of generators, which are near and dear to our hearts, as you will see, they, they, they give very computer science view of all of that is things called transposition. Transposition is a permutation which takes an element, swaps the two, and ij, by the way, are not the, the same. They're different. Swaps them and leaves the rest in place. Okay? As it says, it's swap. This is standard function. You know, std colon colon swap. It's a swap you get a transposition is a permutation. And there is a wonderful theorem on which you could sort of do a lot of things. By the way, this just shows the swap 2, 3, like to A, B, C, D is A, C, B, D. Right? And transposition. Any permutation is a product of transpositions. Well, and then, you know, for mathematicians, maybe it's a theorem. For us, it's a fact of life, yeah. right? It's, I mean, we will prove it. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it should be self-evident. You could, you could do anything you like with swap. You just swap enough. And why well, transposition could put one element to its final destination, right? So if we know that I, uh, first element goes into the fifth element, we could do it with a swap, yes? And then what we know is that with n minus 1 transposition, we will be done. Why n minus 1? Why n minus 1? It is self-evident, guys. The last guy is there. We don't need to put him. This is, there is a remarkable fact. If you have n elements, and if n minus 1 elements are in their final destination, the remaining element must be in its final destination. There's no other place to be. Right? Sort of. Or in other words, if we have a permutation of two elements, we need only one swap. We put one guy in his final destination. The line. If we have three guys, we need two swaps, and so on. It's n minus 1. It's, for me, when I realized it, I remember it was a long time ago, it was a revelation. I mean, I actually, you know, the last guy is, I don't have to do anything. He's just there. It's a very pleasant feeling. Uh, Right, and then we could compose them. I mean, transposition is a permutation. We take a product, 
it's a, it's a group that will give us our, our things. And mathematicians prove many things like that. For example, there is a theorem which sort of they prove in group theory saying the following thing. Let's see if you could prove it right on the fly. That you could define, let's, let us say, uh, let me define the following thing. An adjacent permutation, an adjacent transposition is a transposition which transposes i and i plus 1. Adjacent element. Now, prove that any permutation could be represented as a product of adjacent uh, transpositions. Yeah, bubble sort. That is, it actually depends on the following lemma, that any transposition could be represented as a product of adjacent transposition. Right? You just bubble one guy up and bubble the other guy down, and you're done. Right? It's not a very efficient way, but if you deal with, say, singly linked lists, that's the best you could do. Right? Often. Right? So we will, we will deal with this. This is not good enough because you mess up other elements that might be in place. No, I fix them on the, up the way back. I bubble this one up and then bubble the rest down to restore them. Two passes. Two passes. But I could do it. You see, in mathematics, nobody cares. You know, let us look at three L about complexity. That's the, you know, let's just say you could do it. I do not recommend that you use it in the search engine. When you go work for some competitor, then it's a good algorithm. So you see the sort of, I really care about winning. No? Uh, <laughs> Transposition, yes? So this is very, very important thing, which basically means that swap is a fundamental before sort of, before we started using swap, mathematicians were using swap. They knew it is of great importance. I have to mention something because you might, might uh, encounter the stuff. There is a notion of an even and odd permutation. An even permutation is a permutation which is a product of even number of transpositions. And therefore, you could have a group, subgroup of symmetric group of all the even permutations. Because a product of two even permutations is an even permutation. It's not true for odd permutations. And this is another very important group, which you might encounter, called alternating group. So it's denoted by A sub n, sometimes gothic A, but now it's typically A, just A sub n. So these are two very basic groups. And now we, OK. This is something which I might, OK, you, you, re, I, you know, I really, want to you to know that. So maybe we'll solve it together here because it's really so very important. You see, permutations are not commutative in general. Observe that clearly they are commutative when n is 1. Not that many permutations. They're also commutative when n is 2. Not that many permutations. So again, two permutations. One is identity, another one is a swap. Right? And sort of obviously everything commutes. However, the moment n becomes greater than two, commutativity stops. Sometimes commutativity works. That is, certain permutations commute, but not all permutations commute. And we know from this, I mean, if you are clever, when you look at things like that, you say, oh, obviously the only thing I need to look at is how many elements? Three. So let us see that it's not commutative with as few as 
three elements. And observe, the group is very small. How large is the group of commutations with three elements? Six. And it's not commuted, even with six elements. OK, so we have three elements. Let us look here. We have three elements, this, this, and this. Uh, OK. Three, well, I don't know. <laughs> two, two hands and my head. So let us look at the following operations. Transposition of first and second, and transposition of second and third. OK, so let us first do transposition of first and second. Then we do transposition of second and third. That's the result, yeah? Everybody sees that? Huh? Now, let us do the other way. We do transposition first of second and third. Then we do the transposition of first and second. Do they commute? No. This is always good to use demonstrations like that. Now you finally have some faith in mathematics. So here it goes. It's called visual demonstration. So we proved that. And it is a proof, what I just did. It's a, there is a nicer proof, which, well, maybe I could do it. Let us prove that three-dimensional rotations are not commutative. It's a very, very important thing, which actually relates to non-commutativity of quaternions. And for that, we do this. We have Three-dimensional rotations. So this is first rotation. I'm going left, right, like that. And the second rotation is like that. I'm going left, whatever. Not where I'm facing, mind it, but left. Yes? Now, observe. Let us first do first and then second. So I'm going left. And then I am going left. Ah, I'm too old for that. Right? So you saw what happens. Now let us do this. I'm going, no, pardon me. I'm going left. And yeah, then. See, doesn't commute. So always try, and these are very good. Also makes you strong. <laughs> so <laughs> um, there's something in mathematics you know. If I did more group theory, I wouldn't look the way I look now. <laughs> so so we know now that permutation group is not is not abelian. Now, every permutation can be de decomposed into cycles. Obviously, what do we do? Think about it like that. Permutation group, every permutation defines a directed graph on n elements, right? Which is where the element goes, right? So you look at the cycles in this graph. And they have to be cycles because it could never be that two guys go to the same place. So you're going to have some number of cycles. For example, this permutation of six guys have two cycles. One goes into two, to three, to five, to one. First cycle. And then four goes into six, and six goes into four. By the way, observe that when we talk about transpositions, we write them like that, yes? When we write cycles, we write them like that. 
They are, I claim, these are consistent notations. Why are they consistent notation? Because transposition by itself is a cycle. Right? So any permutation could be decomposed. Here, of course, you see that the notation is actually not very consistent when I write this. Because the thing on the left has nothing to do with cycles. Thing on the right deals with cycles. And it's a product of cycles. So how do you know from the context? And if you don't know from the context, you have to say permutation is equal product of cycle. Because then people read words and know what you're doing. Mathematics is often ambiguous. It's just as precise as needs to be. Because they're not communicating to computers, but to fellow mathematicians. So do not, do not overestimate the rigor. Again, any mathematical book starts with about two pages of very rigorous stuff. And then it goes down. Uh, because just, you know, you, you, have to, you have to just let go. Uh, you don't want to bore people. So this is a standard notation. And again, it's obvious that it allows us to decompose any permutation. Then, cycles are disjoint. Because if if you have an element of one cycle, by definition, you will have all the elements, uh, all other elements, and the other way around. So if two cycles intersect, then they coincide. It's like corsets. Remember the same, same sort of thing. They are disjoint. Trivial cycle. Dan, Dan Rose proposed that we should call it a unicycle. <laughs> but, and then, of course, transpositions are going to call bicycles, right? <laughs> so, so, but it's called trivial cycle. A cycle containing one element is called a trivial cycle. You could have trivial cycles. Now, little simple stuff. Again. It's a problem, so you have to tell me. How many non-trivial cycles could the permutation of n elements contain? Not Tom. N over 2. Why? Because a non-trivial cycle has at least two elements. Right? So you could not have more than n over 2. Just cannot. And you say, by the way, what if it's an odd number of elements? The floor. Why? Because one guy has no place to go. I mean, you know, just, you know, of course you could have a cycle with 3. Right? And other, but at most n over 2, two floor of n over 2. Right? Now, could you name a permutation which very useful, practical permutation, which I use daily in my programming, which actually does have n over two cycles? Not you guys, you just. More general, for 20 elements. Something you could do with sequence of 20 or even 26 elements so that it will have, say, 10 or 13 cycles. It couldn't do with fewer cycles. Reverse, yes. Reverse requires this in some sense, in some sense, the hardest permutation because it has most more cycles. And I will sort of, uh, you know, sadly enough, I ran out of 
slides, but let me tell you something which, which I needed slides, but you know, I just ran out of time to, to do them. Uh, sort of the next lecture, we will look at some particular algorithms and two specific algorithms. We will start with reverse, the one we're talking about now, because it is very useful, as we shall see. In a, in another thing is going to, that I'm going to show you some algorithms and say they're very important. You have to take it on faith for now, but before the end of this course, I will try to convince you that they are indeed of fundamental nature. So these two algorithms, reverse and rotate, will actually be used many times during this course. So, and again, rotate, as I told you, relates to GCD. So, you know, in some sense, I need to show you that everything connects. And uh, it's a uh, long time ago. It's, I, actually, now I'm going to tell you a little bit of sort of, there are multiple ways you could view this course. But uh, one of the ways is that Alex is trying to explain all of the mathematics which you need to know to do stable sorting fast and with very little extra memory. And you say, why it's important? Well, we'll see why it's important. But it's a notoriously hard problem. Sort of in the first edition of Knut, this problem was ranked as 49, which is one less than last Fermat theorem. Then it was solved, not very satisfactory in my opinion, but he dropped it to whatever, 37 now. Still very hard problem. So by the end of the course, you will be able to do it in your sleep. So in some sense, one of my goals, yes, uh, one of my goals is to, to sort of show you how to, do, how to do that. And rotation is going to play very, very important role. So does reverse, as you will see. In, to getting to that goal. So, uh, but now just a little tiny bit of mathematics which I could explain with my hands without slides. That now we know that we could de decompose every permutation into cycles, yes? And now let us figure out how many assignments do we need to do in orbitary permutation. Well, what I claim that if you have a non-trivial cycle, how, by the way, how many assignments you need to do to do a trivial cycle? Zero, so we could get rid of this. We don't need to think about trivial cycle. For non-trivial cycle, cycle with say k elements, how many assignments do you need to do? k plus 1. That is, you need to assign everybody to a new position. Everybody is going to move, so you need to move him. Right? Plus, you need one guy to empty. Otherwise, you couldn't. Everybody agrees? So we need k plus 1. So in general, how many assignments you need to do a permutation in place? You need what I claim is that you need to do n minus the number of trivial cycles plus the number of non-trivial cycles. Right? Now, what is the, let us get the upper bound. What is the largest number of non-trivial cycles? n over 2. Right? So the maximum number of assignments is going to be equal to n plus n over 2. And when do we reach the upper bound? When every cycle is small, size 2, in particularly reverse. So in some sense, reverse is the worst of permutations. In some sense, but in some sense, it's the best because it's sometimes very easy to do. Okay, so before we go, let me just give you something. You could view it as a homework problem, but 
it's a tantalizingly interesting problem, I think, for a programmer to think about it. Reverse. Let's assume you want to reverse sequence of n elements. It seems to be simple. Let's assume that this is an immutable single linked list. That is, you could go only forward. Linked list. You could go just single linked list. You could go only forward. Structures like that exist. How do you reverse it? Okay. What is the fastest way you could reverse? If by the next week you figure out how to do it in linear time, give me a call any time of day or night. <laughs> if you figure out how to do it better than quadratic, don't give me a call. I know how to do it. Right? So, which gives you some idea where it should be. But literally, if you figure out how to do it in linear time, my cell phone is in the database. So call me any time of day and night. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>